Good afternoon and welcome to today's ContractingBusiness.com magazine's webinar, Cash is King, Tips for Improving Cash Flow. My name is Mike Weil and I am the Editorial Director of ContractingBusiness.com. I would like to take a moment um, to thank our sponsor of this afternoon's webinar, Sage Peachtree Quantum. I would also like to remind all of you that if at any time you experience audio difficulties or trouble advancing the slides, simply press your F5 key to refresh your webinar console. I would also like to encourage all of you to ask our panel questions. As a question occurs to you, simply type it into the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will be addressing as many of your questions at the end of our presentation. So now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Leslie Shiner has more than 20 years experience as a financial and management consultant. She is the owner of the Shiner Group, a consulting firm that helps contractors gain financial control of their companies. As a business coach, she has worked with both small and large businesses to help them better understand their business practices and maximize their profits. She is the author of numerous publications that focus on the construction industry, including A Simple Guide to Turning a Profit as a Contractor. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Leslie Shiner. Leslie, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Mike, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to you all about cash flow. I want to say cash is king. Cash is the way that we can continue to run our businesses, and without cash flow, businesses will fail miserably. So we're going to talk about six tips for improving cash flow and how you can go about improving your business profitability as well as keeping that cash in your business and having the cash you need to run your business. So with that, thank you for uh, introducing me. I, uh, as, as Mike said, my name is Leslie Shiner, and I have a company called the Shiner Group. Uh, I have an MBA in accounting and finance, and I'm also a Sage Software Certified Consultant. There's a copy of the book that I wrote, and I also write for a couple of different magazines. So we're going to talk about six tips, and we got a couple of acronyms there, and we're going to walk through those and see what, the, what those six tips are going to do to help you manage your cash flow. But before we get into that, we just have to talk a little bit about why cash is so important. I know that you all know that is important in terms of having the money so that you can make sure that you can pay your outstanding bills so that the money flows through to your company so that you have the cash needed to continue to run the company. Without, you know, without adequate cash flows, you really can't survive. There have been studies about how companies have gone bankrupt, and there's actually companies that have gone bankrupt that, are, that were actually profitable but just did not have the right cash flow in order to sustain their businesses. Uh, the cash inflow is important because you need it to not only meet your operational requirements, meaning you have to learn uh, have enough money to pay your bills, but you also have to allow for expansion, profit distribution, purchase of assets, those sorts of things. So that's the important part about cash flow. It's not just revenue and expenses. It's everything involved within your company. So you want to ask yourself a couple of questions. You know, do you develop? Why should I develop these plans? What metrics should I develop around projecting cash flow? And then I have something at the bottom here called WSIC. And I hear that all the time. WSIC stands for Why Should I Care? Uh, for some of you, it's WTFSIC. I'm not going to tell you what the TF stands for, but why should I care? What does it mean to me to uh, manage my cash in my own company? You have to look at the big picture. As I said, it's not just income and expenses or revenue and operating costs. Money in comes from a lot of different places. The majority of your money in comes from sales and collecting receivables, but money also comes in from borrowing funds, say a credit line or a long-term loan. You may be selling off assets or selling inventory. You may have investors that you've acquired that are willing to put money into your company, or you may be earning some investment income. All of those are sources of cash in that are not specific to selling a product or selling a service. And on the other side, money out is in many ways even more important because it's not just paying off your bills. 
You have to have the cash to pay back those loans that you borrowed. You want to have cash to purchase assets. Do you want to get some more service vehicles? Do you need to go out and buy a new computer system? Do you have to also pay your taxes? Do you have to pay estimated taxes? Do you pay corporate income taxes? Do you want to have distributions to the owners? Those are all money out issues that are not specific to just paying the bills of the company. So what we're talking about is looking at the big picture. Cash flow is really money in minus money out not income and not expenses. I just stress that point because a lot of people think about a cash flow statement and an income statement as being the same thing, and they're not. An income statement takes your sales, subtracts out COGS, cost of goods sold, subtracts out operating expenses, and that's your net income. But the question I hear all the time is, if I made this much money, how come it's not sitting in the bank? And that's really the question that you have to ask yourself. Net income or net profit, that's money that you've earned or money that you've made, but you've got the other parts of the cash that are, in essence, what we call balance sheet accounts, things to do with uh, if you aren't con collecting your receivables. You might be showing income on your income statement, but until they pay you, then it doesn't become cash in your bank account. You might be showing a bunch of expenses if you're on an accrual for your income statement, but until you actually pay the expenses, then that's cash out. And as I said, there's other things besides revenue or sales and costs and expenses that affect your cash flow. So net income does not equal cash flow, and that's what's crucial to understand when you're trying to look at your own cash flow and see how you can improve it. There are companies that are extremely profitable that have no cash, and there's companies that have a lot of cash and are still losing money. And especially that's because the flow of your money may not be related to the recognizing of the income and expenses. If I create a big income, big invoice and send out an invoice, I'm going to show a bunch of income, but as I said, until they pay me, I don't actually get the money, then it's not part of my cash flow yet. So let's take a look at what inadequate cash flows can really, how they can hurt you. If you can't pay your vendors or your creditors on time, you don't get to take advantage of early payment dis discounts. You also can't offer or ask for favorable terms. If you hire subcontractors, if you become a slow payer, for those of you that hire subcontractors, your subs don't want to work for you if you're not paying them often or quickly enough. And it's a, it's a cycle. It's actually a bad cycle that, that, that sort of sucks you down into this vortex of, of loss because if you don't have the cash, you can't pay the bills, and then you have to have money to pay interest and finance charges and penalties, which you should have used to be able to pay your bills, but you didn't have the cash to pay your bills. And, oh, you get such a headache from that. And some of you may be suffering from that as we speak. So poor cash management negatively impacts your business in several ways, and in particular in project schedules. If you don't have the money to pay for the suppliers and you have to wait and, and end up on COD, some companies who have become COD, meaning cash on delivery, meaning they have to pay for the equipment and the materials before it gets delivered to the job or to the warehouse, that impacts your project schedule and impacts the timeliness of how you can complete the jobs you're working on. And then the last part about inadequate cash flows is there are many companies that borrow, in essence, against Uncle Sam that don't pay their payroll taxes or their uh, income taxes, and then all of a sudden you get penalties. Those penalties are the number one cause for business failures. But let's look at the more exciting stuff. Instead of looking at the negatives of, of cash flow and inadequate cash flow, let's look at the tips for improving cash flow. We're going to start with tip number one, BBO. BBO stands for Bill Early, Bill Often make those slides appear. Bill early, bill often. I know it sounds very simple, but in essence, you need to be focusing on your invoicing as a way to improve cash flow. Look at the type of work that you do. Do you do smaller jobs? Do you do larger jobs? Do you do residential, commercial, public work? Do you do jobs uh, that are of large size that require deposits? 
Do you have a lot of service components or maintenance contracts? Looking at the way you invoice can improve your cash flow. If you look at the type of jobs that you do, if you have larger jobs, smaller invoices, more frequent and smaller invoices will improve your cash flow in many ways. First of all, the sooner you ask for money, the sooner you get money. Bill early, bill often. I had a client that I worked with, and he was very particular about the way his invoices went out. He worked for a lot of very wealthy clients, and at one time an invoice went out incorrectly, and so his new process or procedure was he needed to review all outstanding bills. He was suffering severely from cash flow problems, and when I sat and, lo and talked in, uh, sat in his office and talked to him, I asked him about that large stack of paper or several large stacks of paper behind him, and he said those are bills that his bookkeeper had prepared but he hadn't sent out yet because he needed to review them and he didn't have time to review them. And then I asked him why he thought he had a cash flow problem. He hadn't sent out the invoices. Like I said, if you don't ask for the money, you're not going to get the money. So you need to be looking at how quickly do you send invoices. If you have a service component to your business, do the technicians leave the bill right then and there or collect the money right then and there or use credit cards to collect the money immediately? Or do you wait until it comes back to the office and then the bookkeeping staff has to create the invoices and then they go in the mail? Think about that time lag. If you're doing larger jobs, you want to have smaller invoices because it makes the customer more committed to the project. It's also a lot easier for customers to pay you smaller bills, several of them, than to pay you larger bills. And when customers have problems with the jobs, if you're working directly for the customer or you're working with general contractors, if they're having problems paying you, the sooner you send them a bill and the sooner they don't pay you, the sooner you find out that they are having financial problems or that they are unsatisfied and you're going to be led down the rabbit hole of promises to pay where you're not receiving the cash. And then the other one in terms of focusing on invoicing is depending on the jobs that you do, if there are change orders, you need to focus on how quickly can you invoice that change work. You know, the rule says you invoice change work before you do it. I know out there in the real world people will laugh if I say that. There are times when you have to actually do the work. But if you can focus on invoicing for change orders as soon as possible, you can improve your cash flow. In terms of invoicing, if we combine that with collections, think about how do you focus on collections. You know, one thing that happens in, in many offices, and the types of offices that you have, the quantity of paperwork from payables is oftentimes larger than the quantity of paperwork from receivables. If you're paying bills and you're paying payroll and your bookkeeping staff is spending all their time and energy on getting the time cards and all the paychecks out and putting all those bills, the constant bills from the suppliers and the vendors, they focus a lot on the payable side and then they wait and focus on the receivable side later. And that's why it's important to, A, focus on receivables and sending out your invoices sooner rather than later, and then immediately focus on collections. Have a planned rep uh, approach. Project managers and technicians need to commit to supporting bookkeeping rules. If the bookkeeper says you can't go out until we collect a deposit, then the project manager can't override the bookkeeper and say, well, this is a good client and I want to be, keep them happy. It's working together as a, plan, as a combined focus on collections that helps improve relationships with customers and improves your cash flow. And then on the larger jobs or the longer-term work that you're doing, you still want to start the collection process as soon as you send an invoice. Within a couple of days of sending out an invoice, there should be a phone call directly to the customer saying, did you get our invoice? Are there any problems with the invoice? Do you have any issues? And can, when can we expect payment? Remind them, you know, this invoice was sent with a uh, due upon receipt or where you need to receive payment within five days or within 15 days, whatever your process is. So start that process immediately, the collection process, as soon as you send out the invoice. I also recommend charging finance charges. A lot of companies say they put, uh, will put finance charges. They have actually on their invoice that they're going to charge a finance charge, but then they never get around to doing it. If you create a process that says we put a finance charge in place, we send them out immediately as soon as the bill is overdue. 
that sends a message to your customer that this is very important. Collections is just as important as performance on the job. You can always go back and, and credit out the finance charge. They can call you up and say, oh, I'm sending the check in the mail. Will you put back, credit back the finance charge? Sure, go ahead and waive that. If you want to be the good guy and waive the finance charge, that's fine, but send the message. I've seen too many companies wait until something's four months, five months, six months out, and then they start sending finance charges, and at that point in time, the customer just laughs and says, you know, I, you're just now doing that because you're trying to prod me, and I'm not going to turn around and use finance charges as a reason to pay you. I know conflict avoidance doesn't seem to have much with cash flow, but conflict avoidance is not helpful for cash flow. If a customer doesn't pay on time, it means there's trouble. And a lot of times you're busy, you don't want to deal with angry customers, you don't want to deal with problems on the job, you don't want to deal with people that are unhappy. And so you put it aside, and all that does is make the receivables go longer, make the issues worse, and then end up either putting a lien or going to court and making jobs that could have been salvaged and relationships that could have been salvaged unsalvageable. Extending credit to customers will absolutely increase your sales. But if the customers don't pay you, it's not going to increase your profits. So when you extend those, those uh, credit and give people the opportunity to pay you later and later, as long as if they're not paying you, it doesn't really help your company. So customer relationships make or break cash flow. I mentioned to learn about what we call the three Fs, not the four Fs, the three Fs, the three Fs, feel, felt, found. Talk to the customer. If they're unhappy, I understand how you feel. I would have felt the same way. Let me research it and tell you, with, tell you about what I found about your issue. If you have angry customers, deal with it. If you want to improve your cash flow, deal with that. Find a way to settle with customers and not let those difficult situations drag out. Dealing with conflict will help your cash flow. What does conflict avoidance look like in your company? For some of you, sometimes this is what conflict avoidance looks like. And again, conflict avoidance can, can play a big part in hurting your cash flow of your company. Tip number two, billing methods do matter. You know, how you bill your customers or invoice your customers really does matter from a cash flow perspective. If uh, you look at two identical companies, one that invoices customers on a weekly basis and one that waits and says they're going to invoice customers on a monthly basis. If you work with general contractors and you are required to invoice monthly, think about how you go about doing that. If you have a company that invoices weekly, it will be more profitable, even if the dollars were the same, than one that invoices monthly because that provides better cash flow. Sometimes you're required to invoice monthly when you're dealing with general contractors, but look at the other part of your business. Look at the business where you can invoice weekly. Look at those businesses, uh, those customers where you can send those invoices out sooner or where you can set up a process. If you think about it, think about the timing. Think about what do you have to pay and when. Do you pay labor weekly? Do you have to pay for your labor? Are you paying your employees on a weekly basis? Then if you are, then perhaps on some of the jobs you can invoice for labor weekly. If you pay your materials monthly, you might want to check your state laws about material deposits, but you may want to invoice that separately. You can schedule your payment dates. I have customers, I have a client that I worked with, and what they used to do is they had to invoice their general contractors on a monthly basis, and they waited until the end of the month, got in all the bills, sent out the invoice on the 8th or 7th or the 8th, the general contractor turned around and paid them 10 days later, and they missed their discounts. Monthly invoicing doesn't mean you cut it off on the 30th or the last day of the month. If you have to do monthly invoicing, go ahead and cut, do a cutoff date on the 25th. Prepare the invoice by the 1st, make it due by the 7th, then you get to have the discount by the 10th. So monthly, even if you are forced to do monthly invoicing, you can move it up so that you are invoicing that as quickly as possible. Make sure that you have, if you have subcontractors or suppliers, find out what your cycle is from an invoicing perspective. With everything being green and everything being, um, bill paying being automatic and being online, 
Make sure that you get your bills that your supply that when you pick up stuff from suppliers, make sure you get those bills into your system immediately. Don't wait until the statement shows up. Use a software product that gets those invoices. When someone goes to the supply house, picks up some supplies, within a day the invoice is emailed or mailed to, to your bookkeeping staff and it's immediately put into your system. So now you know what you have to pay and what you will have to pay. So timing really is everything. Then if you can get all those invoices in there as quickly as possible, now you can create your invoicing. What type of invoicing do you do? Do you do T&M billing, milestone billing, progress billing? Look at the type of work that you do and the type of invoices. If you do T&M billing, you, like I said, you could have one method where you bill labor weekly and material biweekly. If you do have milestone billing, make sure that you, on your milestones, uh, avoid that ab upon substantial completion because that becomes an issue of what's substantially complete. See if you can get your progress bills or your milestone bills to show up with uh, upon start of. And then look at your progress billing. Uh, progress billing is great on larger jobs because it allows for the partial billing of partial work and, and allows you to send out those invoices sooner rather than later and invoice for the work that you've done as soon as you do that work. You also want to control your purchases. One of the things to do is take a look at your supplier bills and take a look at how many bills you have from the supply house. And look at the dates and times. Do you have the situation where you've got people running to the supply house three, four, five times a day? You've got bills that get generated. Are you managing the, the purchasing of your materials so that someone is in charge and using purchase orders so that you know ahead of time what you are purchasing? Control that running to the supply house to pick up something for a job. Look at what you have in your warehouse and look at how you manage your inventory. Look at, do you have a purchase order system? Can you control employee credit card spending? Have strict limits on what people can purchase? The other thing you want to do is take a look at your automatic monthly invoices, automatic monthly payments. One of the things that we've seen is that a lot of companies find that they can start, if they bill you monthly and it automatically shows up on your credit card, you forget about it and then you just pay it and don't think about it. What type of bills do you have on a monthly basis that you're not even aware of or don't even realize? Sometimes, uh, for example, cell phone bills just get paid automatically. The bills get filed. Nobody looks at it, and they start inching up, and you realize you don't have the right plan for your company. What about things like maintenance service contracts that you have to pay for? Maybe sometimes it's better to do a fee for service, or it's better to have a maintenance contract. Look at those sorts of types of purchases that your company has. Look at all of your payment obligations. Maybe you can re uh, negotiate reduced rent or le on your lease obligations. Look at all of these costs to improve your cash flow to reduce your bills. And then go back and take a look at all the equipment you have and all your vehicles. Look at your uh, uh, what we call the rent lease buy decision. Is there equipment that you have that you're not using? Would it be cheaper if you just leased it or rented it when you needed it? Maybe you need to sell off some of your vehicles, or maybe you need to somehow look at your workforce and look at who's got what vehicle and how you can control those costs. Tip number three, let's talk about preparing a cash flow projection. You know, cash flow projection is a really important thing, and it's not the same as an operating budget. You want to start with your profit and loss statement from last year, but you need to start adding other things to it. First, you want to look at the patterns and the trends. What sort of seasonality issues do you have? What happens on the first cold day of the year, the first hot day of the year? What happens in the fall and the spring with the heating and air conditioning? Look at your revenue and your expenses, but look at it from a time frame as opposed to a general uh, full year. Look at a 12-month projection. Let's talk about doing a cash flow projection, but first, let's go ahead and start a poll. I want to see from you... Uh, how you go about answering uh, this question. What do you think, Mike? Um, I think that the question for the poll is, do you prepare a cash flow projection? And your choices for answers are yes, all the time, yes, sometimes, no, but I know we should, and finally, no, we don't see any value in it. Please take a moment and choose your answer and then click the Submit Answer button. And while they're, while they're doing that, I guess my opinion is 
Um, um, you know, I don't run my own business, Leslie, but I tell you what, if I was, I, a cash flow projection would be really important to me because that's how, that's how you run the business. And, and um, uh, so I agree 100% that that's what I would do. Isn't it nice that I agree with myself? That is, and it's always great, you know, when I ask the question of the answer, you know, are you answering what you should do or what you actually do? <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, I don't actually prepare cash flow projections because I don't run my own business, but all the folks in our audience do run their own businesses, and so hopefully, well, we'll see what they do in a minute. Yes, I'm curious to see what the results are, so hopefully you're clicking on those buttons. And, and while we're waiting for the results to come in, I just want to remind everybody in the audience that if, uh, as Leslie proceeds through the uh, um, presentation, if you have some questions, please feel free to click in that question area, type your question, and submit it. And again, we will get to all the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And even if we don't answer all of the questions live, if we run out of time, well, we will make sure that Leslie answers the question and gets back to you. So um, don't, be, don't be shy, folks. If you've got a question, go ahead and type it in. And um, I believe we should have enough time now that we can possibly move on with the presentation. There it is. Okay. I will turn it back to you, Leslie. Wow. That's a great, that's, a, that's very interesting. So about 60, oh, 61% of you don't do it, but you know you should. That's kind of like exercise. I wonder if I asked exercise, if, if we changed cash flow projection and changed the question to do you exercise, if we'd have exactly the same answers. What do you think, Mike? Well, I, you know, I, I know that in my case, that would exactly be my answer because I don't exercise nearly enough. <laughs> so, uh, though, you know, there are people out there who probably exercise too much. I don't know. <laughs> right. So it is interesting, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled that about 18% of you do it all the time and another 18% of you do it sometimes. So, you know, at, you add those two 18s together, you know, when you get 36, you get a, a third of you will, will do it some of the time or all the time. But, again, then the other two thirds thirds of you uh, mostly know you should, but, but you just don't do it. So let's take a look at the steps to doing it. You know, the first step we said was to take a look at knowing, um, at looking at your uh, profit and loss statement. That's the starting point. But the next step is to really start thinking about what we call capital flows. Those are numbers and dollars in and dollars out that don't appear on your profit and loss statement. They don't appear as revenue or expenses. So if you need to go ahead or you want to buy a vehicle or you need to buy equipment, that's called a capital flow because the actual cash out for that equipment is not going to appear on your P&L as a expense. It shows up later in terms of depreciation. And also, when you purchase that vehicle, you may purchase it, say, through a loan. Those loan payments or credit line payments, those also don't appear as, ex as expenses. The interest on the credit line appears in a, as an expense, but the loan payments do not appear as an expense. So not only are we going to take a look at stuff on your income statement, income and expenses, we're going to take a look at other cash in and cash out. And then I, I talk about unusual payments or infrequent payments. You know, one example of infrequent payments is liability insurance. When you have to buy liability insurance, quite often policies are written. Some companies pay 100% up front. Sometimes other companies actually pay 25% um, down and then the rest over nine months. I had a client whose liability insurance policy started on January 1st because that made sense from a calendar perspective. But you know what happened is that meant on the sometime in the middle of December they had to come up with a 25% down down payment on that policy. And you know December is a cash flow difficult time for this company. They want to have cash for bonuses, they want to have cash if they want to go out and buy extra stuff, they want to have the holiday party. December was not their best cash flow month. It was winter and it was slow. People weren't using, they had a, a big service component and there weren't a lot of people calling them in December. June, they had a lot more cash flow. So they felt June was a better cash flow month. So what they did is they actually took that policy and they said, let's just buy a policy for six months. 
They bought a policy for six months. The next policy started July 1st to June 30th. So now every year when they have to come up with that big chunk, that 25% down, they come up with that money in June when they actually have cash. So when you're looking at those unusual payments, sometimes you can change them around to really improve your cash flow. Did it change the cost of their liability? No, but it changed the cash flow of when they had to pay for liability insurance. Another big cash flow problem in many companies is April, especially if you have a service component because I find many of the clients I work with find the phone doesn't ring in April, nobody has any money, they got to pay their taxes. In our state and in many states, uh, property taxes are due in April, and so their customers never have any cash. So the customers don't have any cash, they can't afford to call somebody to come in and service something. So April is always a poor cash month, plus you may have uh, taxes you have to pay for. So make sure there aren't any contracts or maintenance contracts or any sort of unusual payments or recurring payments that, that happen in April and see if you can find them happen some other time. So that's why you want to look at the pattern of your cash flows, the yearly, the weekly, the monthly. You want to tailor this to your business and be able to figure out how you can do a cash flow projection. You want to put together a spreadsheet or use a software product. Whatever you do, you want to put this together. I like Excel and I like several different software products out there because it allows you to change one number and all the other numbers and your totals. Uh, you don't have to redo the math every time. But in essence, you start with your cash balance. You add your job income. You can list it job by job or you can list it profit center by profit center. You can list it customer by customer. Somehow add together all your job income. And then start subtracting out those costs. What are your direct costs? What are your typical recurring overhead costs? What are the unusual and the extra costs? And then you're going to end up with your cash available. So again, when you're looking at this cash, look in the ad component when you're having other sources of revenue. Do you have recurring revenue? Do you sell service contracts? And then look at your uh, cash out or your, your direct costs and look at other sorts of things in terms of overhead costs. What is regular monthly costs? What are the unusual extra uh, infrequent payments? You can put something, I mean, here's just a very simple spreadsheet just so you can see something like that. To throw that in from a uh, uh, Excel perspective to just look at how you would put something together because then you're going to look at your ending cash balance. Then you're going to see which months are you going to need cash. Which months can you, in essence, try and invoice sooner? If you sell maintenance contracts, do you sell them and can you sell them in particular months so that those that revenue from those contracts comes in on the months that you're going to be short on cash? Putting together a sample cash flow or some sort of simple cash flow, one of the reasons I like cash flow is guess what? It's never wrong. You can use the dartboard method. Just pick a number. Just throw together a cash flow with just your best guess. Don't spend a lot of time, but once you start, then you can compare what did you do, what did you think you were going to do, and what did you do. Then the next time you do it, you can make it better. And the next time you can make it better. Because again, cash flow is just a best guess. So I always tell my clients, just start out with the dartboard method. Throw a bunch of numbers on a piece of paper, look at it, and then start to improve it. You can use Excel. Here's another example of a cash flow manager tool that's inside Peachtree Quantum. There's software products out there that can help you do this so that you can focus on creating a cash flow statement, a, I'm sorry, a cash flow projection to help you determine when are you going to need cash, when are you going to be flush with cash, when should you borrow money, when should you pay back your loans. Once you do it, now you can start monitoring your projections. You want to keep it at a very sort of basic, sort of very high level. Don't get stuck in the weeds. You want to keep it at a very general level. You can look at your weekly and monthly. You compare what you estimated it to be to what it actually was and gather together all the information within your company. Look at your accounts receivable aging. Look at your accounts payable aging. Look at those sort of typical monthly expenses, special expenses, and really try and monitor that. So as I said, stick with the dartboard. Just start throwing darts at it, and then hopefully you'll get closer and closer to the, bull, to the bullseye as you move forward. 
You don't have to be really good at it. All you have to do is just, uh, as I say, use the Nike, the Nike solution. Just do it and then keep moving forward. Once you do this, you'll find there's really benefits to cash flow projections. You can now forecast when you're going to need to borrow money or when you're going to need to invest. You can also forecast uh, ways to maximize your working capital. So you'll say you'll figure out which months are, have more cash and which months have less cash. You'll look at the jobs that you're starting. Take a look at your backlog of the jobs that you're starting and see when's the cash flow in each of those jobs. When's it going to be tight? Are you what I call money ahead or money behind? If you're able to co collect customer deposits on the work that you do, you can be money ahead on jobs. That's great. If you're money ahead on jobs because you're collecting customer deposits, then the money comes in, you use that money to purchase the equipment for the jobs. If you're doing other work where you have to, where your money behind, think about a job that, that's a large job that you're doing on, and, uh, for a general contractor and you're billing monthly. You may have to pay for cash out of your company six weeks of labor before you get paid for, before you get paid for that labor. You've got to cover the first four weeks. You can only bill monthly. You send them an invoice. They take two weeks to pay you. You need to come up with six weeks of a cash of labor on that job before you even get paid. And that's where you want to use a cash flow projection to help you do that, to help you improve that, your supplier relationships. You can't just turn uh, to, your, to your labor force. Let me know if you figured out a way to do this and say, you know, I'm really sorry, but our, customer, our client hasn't paid us yet. You know, can I just not pay you this week? If you guys have any of those labor employees, let me know because I want to know how you managed to do that. Labor is one of those things you're going to have to pay weekly whether you get paid or not. So the goal of uh, cash flow projection and the benefit is you get to stop being caught, caught off guard where all of a sudden you look, there's no cash in the bank. And again, if you have the cash, you can take uh, advantage of opportunities and you can improve your profitability. Let's look at tip number four. Tip number four, OPM stands for other people's money. If you can use other people's money, and the more you can use other people's money, the better your cash flow is going to be. If you can use your customer's money instead of your own money, then you will improve your cash flow. Again, as I said earlier, you want to bill and you want to collect. You want to send out invoices and you want to collect. You want to set your customer expectations about payments. And you want to follow the procedures. Is there a way that you can set it up where you have to buy the materials, you invoice the customer, you receive the money from the customer, then you can pay for those materials. If you do that, you're successfully using other people's money. So look at ways to use other people's money so that you are not having to be cash behind on all of your jobs and be, in essence, uh, coming up with cash before the customer pays you. Think about the use of credit cards. We can talk about credit cards in two ways. One is improving cash flow if you accept credit cards, and the other is using cash, uh, credit cards to improve your cash flow for your purchases. Here's, a, here's an example. If you use credit cards to buy your supplies, see if your suppliers will take credit cards as, as payment. If you do that, you can, in essence, as long as you know your billing cycle, you can in essence, float cash for quite a while. If my cutoff date is the first, and I purchase a bunch of materials on day one, let's say, let's go back to November 1st, I'm not going to get my statement until 31 days later. So the cutoff date is the 31st, and then on December 1st, I get my statement. And then if I get a 15-day leeway to pay my bill, I pay the bill on the 15th, I've effectively floated my cash for 45 days. Now, I recommend this as long as you routinely have the cash to pay your credit card. If you are not the type of company that can pay your credit card and you're funding your company with credit cards, which is a very bad idea, they have extremely high interest, then you don't want to do this. But if you're sure that you have the cash to pay, when you can make your purchases and pay your suppliers using credit cards, you can float the cash so that you can wait until a customer has the money to pay you. Tip number five, take all, all uh, discounts. I'm hoping that you take your early payment discounts. It is what I call free money. It's free income and will absolutely improve your bottom line. It's also negotiable. 
you know, take a look at how much you spent with your suppliers and call them up and say, you know what, I want a discount. And you give me a 1%, I want a 2% discount. What discount will you give me? It never hurts to call your suppliers and ask for it. All they can do is say no. And I always recommend that you track discounts as a separate line item. It is, in essence, an increase to income. I do not actually use it to decrease my expenses, and I do not usually recommend passing on early payment discounts to the customer. An early payment discount is a bonus that you get because you're so good at managing your own cash. That's the source of an early payment discount. Some people say, yeah, but it's only 1% or 2%, and I don't have the cash, and it's probably not that worthwhile. So let's take a look at it. We're going to play a little math game. Let's run a poll. All right, Leslie, thank you very much. Everybody, if you look at this slide, our poll is as follows. Take a moment to answer the following question. If you take a 2% discount, what is the equivalent interest rate? Choice 1, 2%. Choice 2, 12%. Choice three, 36.5%. And if you're like me, there's choice four, no idea. So please take a moment, pick the right answer for you, and click the Submit Answer button. And like I said, Leslie, for me, uh, math being one of my strong fortes, I would have to sit down and figure that one out. <laughs> Okay, well, you know what, it might be a good idea is to just guess. And, you know, that's what I like people to do. Like I said, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm up for the dartboard method. If, if you don't know what it is, you go ahead and you just guess a number, and then later we'll, we're going to run through the math, and I'm going to give you the answer. So, so take a look. I, and, if I took ahead. a stab at 36.5%, <laughs> um, uh, um, how would that impact me as I, if I was working and that was what, what the number that I was working with? How would that impact me? Well, we're going to look at the number, and we're going to see how that impacts. So we're okay. going to go ahead and, and finish up the poll. I think people probably have had a chance to answer. What do you think, Mike? Well, I, you know, I see that they, the, the uh, answers haven't come up yet, so I'm going to take a moment, first of all, to thank everybody who has. Well, there, there you go. The audience view is up. So, uh, Leslie, they have the answers. See, uh, oh, Lawrence good. It looks like, looks like uh, other than the 5% even that said 2%, we got sort of a third, a third, and a third. We got a bunch of you thinking it's 12 and a bunch of you thinking it's 36 and a lot of you with the no idea. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at those answers and see. It's, you'll, uh, you know, 30, a third of you are not going to be surprised. The answer actually is 36.5%. And that's a big interest earnings if you think about it. The reason it's so high is that if you think about it, when somebody offers you a 210 net 30 discount, when they offer you a 2% discount, that's a discount for not paying a year early. It's actually a discount for only really paying 20 days early. A lot of times the terms are, the terms are 210 net 30, means that you get a 2% discount if you pay either by the 10th of the month or within 10 days. Otherwise, they're going to start charging you a finance charge if you don't pay by the 30th or within 30 days. So really, they're giving you a 2% discount for just paying 20 days early. And if you think about that, you take that 20 days, you divide by 365, and then you, in essence, multiply that times the 2%. That means that it annualizes out to an actual interest uh, APR, an interest rate of 36.5%. So if you think about it, if you can make a two a early payment and you can get a two percent discount on an early payment to a supplier, that is in essence earning you thirty six and a half percent on your money. So a lot of times I get people who who think that that's such a high number and that couldn't possibly be be the answer. But hopefully you've you've seen that that is actually the answer that you can in essence get a thirty six percent return on your money if you can start taking your early payment discounts whenever possible. So what should you borrow? What, when should you borrow? If you're needing cash, there's a couple of ways to borrow money for cash. One is, in essence, you can use credit cards. Credit cards have the highest interest rate, highest finance charges, and I don't recommend borrowing money off your credit card. But if cash is tight and you, are, you know that there are payments coming in at the end of the month, you can use credit cards to pay for your purchases as long as you know there's going to be cash when the actual bill comes due. There's also charge cards, which are different than credit cards. Things like companies like Amex give you charge cards. You, um, 
can use them for large material payments that need to get reimbursed by the customer, and you can use them for larger charges. They have a different uh, payment schedule, and so you can look at the difference between the two. Then there's a credit line, and credit lines are used to improve your cash flow for basically short-term borrowing. It should fluctuate. You borrow, and then you pay back. You borrow, and then you pay back. Uh, the balance should fluctuate uh, and, and at some point in time go to zero. In fact, in the olden days, and there's still a couple of companies out there, banks out there, that when they give you money for a credit line, you actually have to carry a zero balance for 30 consecutive days. Credit lines should never be used to fund your company in essence, to buy capital purchases, to buy vehicles, and they should be just used as a cash flow crunch, not to sustain your company so that you can operate. And then ultimately, if you have longer-term loans, you want to have term loans. Those oftentimes have lower interest rates. Those are the kinds that are used for capital purchases, vehicles, and that sort of things. Term loans should never be used to cover operating expenses. Credit lines should be used to cover operating expenses. Term loans should not be used to cover operating expenses because it means that your profit isn't enough to bring in the cash that you need to run your company. You'll very quickly see you're in trouble if you use term loans for operating cash. Who should you never, ever, ever borrow from? The IRS. The IRS, if you can't make a tax payment and you say, well, I'm just going to hold off on that, you, are, you will receive a 10% penalty if you are three days late. And using the same math we did with discounts, if you annualize that, that's a 1,200, 1,200% 1, 1, per year interest rate. Now, I'm never quite sure why the IRS does not allow usury. There are laws against usury interest rates, but for some reason the IRS can charge you a 10% interest, a 10% penalty, which works out to, in essence, a 12% interest rate. So never, if you're out of short on cash, borrow money from the IRS. And then let's just take a look at the, uh, quickly at the last one. Uh, uh, be aware of underbillings and overbillings if you are cash ahead or cash behind. Overbillings are great. They really help with cash flow. They help with cash flow because you get to front load your contract and you get the money up front. But they are also dangerous because they overstate your profit. And if you use the overbillings, the money that you collect for to tomorrow's job to finish off yesterday's job, you get in trouble. And if you're running out of cash to finish the job, that's when you're in trouble with the overbillings. In fact, I have a little graph here. If you are overbilled, you'll see in red your cash comes in before your expenses. And that's great until all of a sudden your volume starts to stabilize or fall. And when your volume falls, your cash in falls quicker than your expenses. And if you don't have the cash left in the bank, there's no more cash coming in to pay your bills. So that's where you can get in trouble when you are overbilled. On the other hand, underbillings will hurt cash flow. If you are cash behind on jobs, if you do the work and you haven't created the invoice or you haven't gotten the money yet, then underbillings will also hurt your cash flow. As a company grows, and many of you may have suffered in the last couple of years, and now you're finding that 2011, the statistics all say that companies are improving and growth is, is out there. As you are underbilled and you grow, that will, growth will cause cash flow problems because volume increases, accounts receivable oil will increase, and cash flow is going to be tight. So you want to be careful as your company grows. You will want to be careful because that causes a cash flow problem. If you think about the last couple of years when you've got a drop in volume and you're cash behind, sometimes I'm always, I joke with customers and I say, look, you know, if you're a company and all of a sudden you've got money in the bank when you have been struggling for cash, it might mean you're about to go out of business. Because if you always are behind on money and you're invoicing the customer, as soon as your volume drops and you don't have any more invoices going out, you're starting to go out of business, but then all those customers finally pay you and then all of a sudden, your cash continues to go move forward and your revenue starts to fall. So you want to be careful in looking at your cash in and cash out and whether you're money ahead or you're money behind on your job. So the, the last and the final, that sixth tip, says you want to make sure that you're looking at are you overbilled or underbilled. So in summary, you have to look at two identical companies if they have the same income and the same expenses, but one actually tracks manages cash flow. The other one is at the mercy of customers. Is it really going to make a difference? And the answer is absolutely yes. 
it's absolutely important to track your cash flow. So we looked at those six tips, BBO, bill early, bill often. Your invoicing and billing methods matter. Make sure you prepare a cash flow projection. Try as hard as you can to OPM, use other people's money. Take all your discounts and be aware when you are overbilled or underbilled and the effect of that on your cash flow. With that, I do want to thank Sage Peachtree, and I want to thank Mike for giving me that opportunity. I'm going to hand it over to you for Q&A. All right, Leslie, thank you very much. And uh, a few of you have already submitted some questions, and we're going to get to those in just one second. But I just want to um, uh, remind you that while we're answering your questions, we're going to have a feedback form that we're going to put up on the screen, and we would love you to take a moment and fill that out. Um, if you have a pop-up blocker um, on your uh, web browser, please disable that so that you can get the form. And having said that, let's get into the first questions. And actually, there were um, more statements than questions, so I am just going to read some of the statements and questions. And Leslie, um, feel free to comment on these. The uh, first statement is actually from Matt Prezenka from Abacus Business Leaders. Um, he says, um, that th should we mention that 13-week cash flows are the first tool that banks use to analyze distressed companies? In my opinion, in Matt's opinion, any company with over $250,000 of revenue needs to have this on a weekly basis. Monthly statements are too far apart to plan for shortcomings. It is also important to perform CF projections if you take on larger pro um, projects than what you have been accustomed to. You may, not, you may need to increase your borrowing facilities. Leslie, what do you have to say to that? Yes, thank you, Ma uh, Matthew. I think that's, that is important, and I think you're, you're very, very right in a couple of things. One is when you start taking on larger projects, a lot of times the cash flow on larger projects is what really hurts companies because they're not used to that um, in terms of how that affects their cash flow. So, yes, I absolutely agree, and I thank you for supporting me on the fact that a 13-week cash flow is the first tool that a bank's going to use. They want to see what's your cash out there for 13 weeks. You know, it's hard to project what I'm going to have in terms of seven or eight months, but I better be able to project the cash in and the cash out over the next 13 weeks. Okay, um, the next question comes from Joe Belinsky from AMS. And Joe asks, although I don't prepare a cash flow projection, I have used previous year's expense reports to budget and try to find some ways to lower expenses. Is this the same thing? And that's a great question. And you know what? The answer is no. Uh, the, the last year's expense reports and uh, previous year's expense reports to budget that are, are the starting point and absolutely integral to creating a cash flow projection. But what they don't include are things like loan payments, vehicle payments, purchasing of assets, paying back loans. All of those expenses and those cash out things do not show up on your expense reports. So yes, I think it's great to look at your expense budgets as a starting point and to find ways to lower your expenses. That's great. That's a, a, a fantastic idea. And then to just take it one step further and take a look at all those expenses, look at lowering your, your expenses, and then also look at all those cash out things that don't actually show up on your income statement but are still things that are coming out of your checking account. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. The, um, the next statement comes from Thomas Car Karwaki from Capital Dynamics. And he says, suppliers start putting customers on a credit watch when they start missing the discount windows, especially if they have made such payments. Your comment? Right. Right, and absolutely, and I've seen that happen. So if you start making, if you're on a regularly doing discounts and taking those discounts, and you start taking the, and you stop taking those discounts, suppliers start to get worried. So yes, you know when you put a when a supplier starts putting their customers on a credit watch, that's where the that cycle starts to to fall apart, where your cash flow starts to fall apart. And again, it's very cyclical. If cash flow is bad, all the things happen to make it worse. If cash flow is bad. Then you get put on a credit watch, and then you start having interest and penalties, and that makes your cash flow worse. 
So as you start going down this cycle, making it worse and worse, it's very difficult to get out of a huge cash flow crunch. It's better to pre- prevent that. And if you can pay bills on time and you don't have those penalties and you now get the supplies when you need them, that's why it's important to be on the upward part of that spiral, not the downward part. All right. Thank you again, Leslie. Thomas also wants to know um, what's preferred, a monthly versus a weekly cash flow analysis. Right. Well, you know, I like to go back to um, that that comment, and I forget the gentleman who made the comment about the 13-week. You know, the next three months is a weekly cash flow because I think it is important to see what's going to happen. As you get for, moving forward, you can then do the rest of the year in a monthly cash flow. So it's really hard to try and figure out what's going to happen in the next couple of, or in the weeks of, in September, October, November, but it it should be pretty easy to determine what's going to happen in January, February, and March. So I recommend doing a weekly, monthly cash flow where the first, the next three months are weekly, and then the following uh, nine months are done monthly. Very good. And the next question actually is going to come from me, Leslie, because you know I like to throw one out every once in a while, and that's this: if there's available cash, is it better to pay down the credit line or pay the bills that allow for early payment discounts? Well, and that's a that's a good question too. You know, we looked at the numbers of that, and we said, you know, paying something twenty days early is in essence the same as a thirty six percent return. If you think about what your credit line is charging, hopefully you do not have a credit line at thirty six percent. So I actually recommend if you have available cash, it is better to pay to uh, pay those bills that allow for early payment discount and use that money so that you can get that discount and then hopefully that improves your cash flow so that you will sooner rather than later start to be able to pay down your credit line. Very good. And um, Thomas Karaki from, Dy- and I'm sorry, Thomas, if I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me, uh, from Capital Dynamics also sent in a comment um, back on the discount um, part of the discussion. He says that the 2% discount differs if it is 10 days or two weeks. And he's, he did that as a, as a statement. Maybe, Leslie, you could explain what that difference is. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he's, uh, if that was a question or a comment. Uh, I think that uh, you're looking at 10 days is actually... Um, Two weeks is 14 days, and when it comes to money, money and interest uh, accrues over the weekend just as much as it does during the weekday. So a 10-day discount includes, um, in essence, 10 days, not 14 days, whereas two weeks is a 14-day 14, 14 time frame. So I think what he's talking about is the fact that when you have to pay interest or when you get a discount or when you're earning money, it's the same on a Friday as it is on a Sunday. And I will also say I saw that Thomas did have a comment. I don't know, Mike, if you were going to mention that, but the hooray for tracking the discounts separately because I see too many companies that use those discounts and flow through to reduce expenses. It's always important to take a look at the end of the year how much money, in essence, you've earned or how much you've saved so that your discounts are tracked separately. They are a separate line item, and quite often they are a source of other income. Very good. And, and I didn't see that, so thank you for, for um, um, seeing that. Um, I have one more. Uh, we have time for about two more questions. So this one comes from Megan Havel from Riverside Fabrication, and uh, Megan asks, what steps do you suggest that we take if we are in a cash flow crunch to get out of the cash behind status? Oh, wow, that's great, Megan. You know, and, and it's, it's, when you're in that cash flow crunch, it's, it's, uh, the, the odds are it forces you to be in a worse cash flow crunch. So what I would do is I'd, I would prepare one of those 13 weeks cash flow statements, take a look at that, see what bills you can postpone, and then really analyze all of those Invoicing. Look at all the jobs you're working on, all the customers you're doing, looking and maybe you have the opportunity to sell some maintenance contracts if you do that as well. So really focus on what are your sources of income. There are companies out there, uh, and I've worked with companies, when they're in a cash flow crunch, they actually offer a discount. They offer a discount to their customers that say, you know what, I'll give you a 2% discount if you pay me today as opposed to paying me a month from now. 
So find ways to improve that cash flow by looking at opportunities for invoicing, opportunities for collecting money from customers, and opportunities for holding off on some of your uh, bills and see where you can where you can do that. Sometimes if you're in a real cash flow crunch, you can do something like pay rent and say, can I pay you now half of it and pay you half and start doing it every two weeks. Maybe that helps. Sometimes landlords will actually let you do that if, the, if rent is a big chunk of your cost. Find ways to spread those out. You know, speaking of two-week uh, increments, Leslie, do, um, do, does having biweekly payroll help cash flow? Uh, in some cases, it actually does. In some cases, if you only have to come up to the cash every two weeks and you can time that similar to your invoicing, it will help. It helps in a couple of ways. One is the amount of time it takes to prepare a payroll is sort of cut in half. You're still entering the time cards. Um, and it will, it can potentially improve your cash flow if you are, have customers that are used to paying you biweekly. So sometimes you might want to look at that. A lot of times, you know, employees can't live on biweekly payroll. But it's just something that you might want to consider and see if you put together a little uh, projection, see if it would make a difference. Look at the timing of your expenses and see if a biweekly payroll might help your cash flow. Very good, and thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid that we've run out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of ContractingBusiness.com, I'd like to thank all of you for joining the webinar today. I also want to recognize and thank the program sponsor, Sage Peachtree, and finally, I'd like to thank Leslie Shiner for an excellent presentation. Please have a productive and safe remainder of the day. Thank you very much.